Castelli from the United States. The rule is that each presenter will be provided five slides and no more than five minutes, and we will take questions for five minutes, but we must be finished by nine sharp. Before we start, I have to make an announcement. We were informed that the embargo on Trilogy ACS study was broken last night, and I have to say that the European Society of Cardiology regrets strongly this behavior because we believe that it breaks the usual ethical code of conduct that we have regarding the presentation of hotlines. Having said that, I would like to call immediately the first presenter, who is Professor Salim Yusuf. Salim is going to speak on patients, patterns of risk uh, factor prevalence for cardiovascular disease globally by urbanization, gender, and economic status of countries. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we all know of uh, several risk factors from the inter-heart study and the inter-stroke study that predict cardiovascular risk. PURE is a prospective study that has three components. First component is the description of the risk factor distribution around the world by region, by ethnicity, by urban and rural, and by economic status. The second component is a description or is an understanding of what causes the risk factors, and the third one is the consequences of the risk factors. Today, I'm only going to talk about one part, the risk factor distribution uh, by itself, and I'm only, because of lack of time, only going to focus on the lifestyle risk factors of diet, tobacco, and activity, which drives the rest. The study is conducted in, uh, it involves 154,000 people from 628 communities, half urban, half rural, in 17 countries from all continents of the, inhabited continents of the world except, uh, uh, except Australia. This is the first study, the uh, first result. On the left side is plotted the relationship between country GDP uh, going from low to high and the uh, intake of fruits and vegetables. And for your convenience, intake of about 500 grams a day is five servings a day. You will see one third of the countries in the world are below this, but as countries become richer, they consume more fruits and vegetables. Wealth index is a way of standardizing across the world based on assets, the income of a household, and you'll see an extremely clear relationship between wealth, increasing wealth, increasing fruits and vegetable consumption, but yet one third of the world's population are not consuming adequate uh, amounts. Uh, however, this is counterbalanced by an increase in fat consumption. This is in grams, which again increases with GDP, but much more strongly by individual household wealth, and it's a tight relationship, and all these are 95% confidence limits around each blob. So they are, each one is almost significantly different from the other. And of the um, uh, total fats, it's saturated fats, that's increasing, and it's due to the increasing uh, consumption of meats, both red meats and non-red meats. Protein intake also increases with increasing GDP and, and with increasing wealth, but then it plateaus out, but there is a limit to what you can take. Now, because people take more proteins and more fats in the richer countries, they tend to take less carbohydrates from about 50% of the diet in the uh, in the richer people to up to about 65%. Carbohydrates are a cheap source of energy, and in poor countries like India and uh, Pakistan and Zimbabwe, the uh, increase in fats is substantial. This is Sweden, this is Canada, and this is uh, UAE here. Now, the other part of it is as countries become wealthy or as individuals become wealthy, the activity as a whole uh, decreases. Now, just for you to know, three, um, uh, the, uh, if you look at the difference between the well, least wealthy and the most wealthy in the study, it's nearly 2,000 uh, mets per minute per week. This equates 2.7 hours of brisk walking every day. Now, because of that, when you look at, sorry, it's not here. Because of that, what, the reason for this is because 
obligatory uh, activity that is job related, transport related, and household related decreases. But recreational activity increases with increasing wealth, but the increase is only one fourth. So there is no way that unless you're a marathon runner every day that you're going to overcome the decrease in activity due to the changing environment. So the obesity epidemic really requires a change in environment. We can yell at people and say exercise and 30 minutes a day, five times a week is not going to be enough. That's about one fourth of the difference of loss of uh, activity, which means in future in this press conference, you'll all be on a treadmill while I too will be on a treadmill talking to you. Uh, smoking, you will see uh, this is males, this is females. The female smoking depends not only on GDP, it depends on cultural factors like the Muslim countries, the Asian countries, the women don't smoke. But in men, which is the green, you will see a clear inverse relationship from about 45% in the poorest countries to about 20% in the rich countries. And when you look at by wealth index, men, there is a clear inverse relationship. In women, it's flat. Now, this is because every, men everywhere in the world started smoking at about the same frequency, but the rate of quitting has been markedly high in the richer countries and the richer people so that current smoking is low. This is important because the focus of smoking should be on quitting. It's the people who are alive today and are smoking today who will die in the next 40 years from tobacco. So the primary focus should be on quitting. And of course, if you get people to quit, their children will not start. So this is what is called the epidemiological transition. And this is what determines risk factors. And what the rest of our research is, which we'll hopefully present next year, is what causes these differences between people and between countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Salim. So